Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this episode of Backstory, we're talking about Military Intelligence and You, a satirical film that pokes fun at military cliches while alluding to the Bush administration's handling of the war in Iraq. Writer-director Dale Katzera wove authentic footage from World War II training films with present-day actors in scripted scenes to tell this hilarious and cutting tale. Dale, welcome to Backstory. Thank you for having me. So the film we're going to see mixes archival footage with material you scripted and directed. I have got to imagine there's millions of feet of declassified so-called military intelligence information and footage out there, right? Yes. Okay, so how does one begin to sift through the mountain of this material to figure out what's going to work for the narrative you want to create? Well, uh, that was in part the fun of the whole project. At least for me it was. I'm a film history buff. Okay. I, I like old movies. And I knew about the uh, first motion picture unit, which okay. was the military unit uh, that made all these films. And this was started specifically in World War II, this, this unit? Yeah. Okay. yeah. The, um, I'd actually written a script that was set in World War II, and as part of my research on that, I, I came across some of these films that you can see them here and there, and yeah. some of them are played every so often on Turner Classic Movies okay. and things like that. Okay. And of course, it's probably the most famous one was Why We Fight series yes. that uh, Frank Capra made. Yes. Uh, kind of explaining uh, why uh, it was important for us, for us to go to war yeah. in World War II. And uh, so I knew that there were these films out there. I didn't know where they were. Okay. I didn't know uh, how I could get my hands on them. And it took a lot of research, frankly, just to try and track them all down back in the Library of Congress and figure out who has them now, where they're kept at, what condition they're in. And I spent a week back in D.C. basically just watching tapes of film after film after film. There's, there's very little documentation about this particular chapter in kind of war, World War II slash Hollywood history. Okay. And, but the first motion picture unit was basically designed to take the best Hollywood talent yep. and to give them the task of educating our troops, yeah. telling our troops not only how to do what they do, yeah. but why they're doing it. If I recall, I, I remember some of the striking footage John Ford also shot in the Pacific when he yeah. was working in this. You see, the, the first motion picture unit was kind of a, was part of the, there was, part of that was the signal corps. Yes. So, so part of these guys were not just guys that were working, making training films on sound stages in Hollywood. But they were also the guys that were given 16 millimeter Bell and Howell cameras right. and sent out to the battlefield. Right. And that's where John Ford was. He yeah. shot uh, a couple of big films. Uh, I think there was one Battle for the Illusions, I yeah. think was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very and, famous uh, one. Yeah. And I think his, one of his won a doc, uh, an Academy Award as the best documentary. So you're in yeah. Washington, D.C., and I'm going to imagine you're in some facility that, you know, in a way you allude to in the film. That, yeah. What was that like? I mean, were people helpful? Were they, well, was, was there a bit of a sinister sense of I, why are you probing for this information? Um, I imagine the warehouse in uh, from Citizen Indiana Kane. Jones. Well, Citizen Kane, Citizen I, Kane, Citizen Kane right? is the one yeah, I the, keep, the, keep, yeah. keep. That was that was my mind. Right. But I uh, I am a museum buff and okay. a, a library buff. I like archives. I like museums. I like digging around uh, and for stuff and finding stuff, and. There was uh, a lot of people have used this footage over the years in various documentaries. Almost okay. any World War II documentary you'll find will use clips from Why We Fight yeah. or from uh, Memphis Bell mm -hmm. or some of these other films. But there were a whole array of these films made. Some were made in a very direct style. Uh, most of them, I'd say, in fact, were made in a very direct uh, instructional film style, mm -hmm. the kind of thing you'd probably saw as a kid in school. Sure, yeah. Some of them, though, made, a small percentage of them, but some of them were made in a really interesting, dramatic style. They, were, they had scripts, they cast actors, they built sets, they had okay. great cinematographers, they were shot on 35 millimeter film. Those are the films I went for. And these films, the difference is, you know, obviously there were filmmakers at that time making films for us, meaning the general public. You're talking about films that were really made for soldiers. Yeah, some of these films had never really been seen in, right. in 50, 60 years. Right. They're so obscure that, that they really had never been brought out of the archives and screened in any kind of, uh, uh, you know, public capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the films, there's one I used called uh, Resisting Enemy Interrogation. Mm -hmm. That film had, did have a theatrical release. There was, and it actually right. was nominated as a best documentary of that year. I think it was 1943. 
strange because it was a narrative story. Yeah. But back then, a documentary could be a narrative story as long as it was trying to teach you and educate you about yeah. something. So when I went back to D.C., I was pretty ruthless in my uh, assessment because there are lots of these films. Yeah. And they all have titles like How to Swim, you know, or The Backstroke, you know, yes. or something like this. Yeah. Or Cleaning Your Rifle. Cleaning Your Rifle mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, Introduction to Aviation. Or, I mean, anything you can imagine, mm -hmm. you know, they have a film on it. That mm -hmm. A film was made about these things. And I would just basically go through very quickly and look mm -hmm. for a, a few seconds of the film. Mm -hmm. And I could tell if it was made in a narrative style right. or if it was a purely instructional film. Right. And the ones that I went for, because I knew I was going to be trying to weave a story from these old clips, well, that's what were I wanna, the narrative ones. That's what I want to try to get to. As you're going through this process, is the narrative shaping itself then, or did you already have a notion of what you specifically needed to fit your story? Uh, no, I didn't know what I, was, okay. what I needed. Okay. <laughs> this thing was, was, in a way, it was a documentary. It was kind of made like a documentary film would be made. Right. It was written as I went along. Okay. And it was written really all the way through post-production, okay. you know. And the the real trick, though, was to try and see if there was enough footage to hold the story together. Yeah. And so when I went back there, I was looking specifically for opportunities to take footage that might fit together mm -hmm. from one film to another film. And a good example is there's a film called Recon Pilot, uh, which starred William Holden as a reconnaissance pilot yep. and the story has him as a great fighter pilot great trained you know best in his class in fighter school but he is assigned to be a recon pilot he's really disappointed about this because he wanted to be a fighter pilot because he wanted to kill the enemy until he discovers and then of course through the story he discovers that he does this great run he finds an enemy base they bomb it and he becomes kind of a hero and yeah. he discovers hey recon pilots yeah also kill the enemy, yes, yes. even if we just take pictures. Yes. And that was a film specifically made because the Army Air Corps had a lot of people that specifically wanted to be fighter pilots. Yeah. They did not want to go into aerial reconnaissance. Yeah. So I could take that shots of, from that film yeah. and marry them to another film yeah. called Photo Analysis for Aerial Bombardment, which yes. starred Alan Ladd as a photo analysis. And his right. job is to look at these pictures and to right. try and you know, determine uh, where, yeah. the, uh, where the bad guys are with the base. And so now, you could then mix the footage together. I could together mix, mix and match. Now, now, of course, in the film, William Holden is in the Pacific Theater and uh, Alan Ladd is in Europe. Yeah. So there's some yeah. little bit of fudging is necessary. But it's amazing how much fudging you can do yeah. uh, in a movie and still kind of the audience well, accepts the, it. The, the central glue, as you say, is your narrative and yeah. your characters. And it looks like you went through quite a lot to recreate or create mm -hmm. a, if you will, quite high style war room yeah. of sorts. And I'm presuming this happened on a sound stage, but this is not just a, any old set. This is a this is a creation of an environment where mm -hmm. you know sort of the the central story unfolds. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know putting that together? What kind of resources you had to to get the uniforms, the look, mm -hmm. uh, and how you went about doing that? Well, uh, at some point in time, uh, the thought that I could put a film entirely of old movies together, yeah. that was kind of set aside. I didn't think there was a way of doing okay. it entirely of old films. So at some point, some friends and I, we kind of gotten together and we said, well, it looks like we're going to have to shoot some new stuff, yeah. which I did not mind because I had not made a film, frankly, since I was here at the University of Washington uh -huh. making short films. Okay. And I really wanted to make a film. I like making films and making films is fun and working yeah. with uh, DPs and editors and yeah. cast and crew. And it's, it's, it's great fun. So what I wanted to do, though, was I knew this could be very limited. And so we had to be very resources, very, very low budget in this film, very limited resources. Mm -hmm. So I thought, OK, we can do Central Command. We can do okay. Central Command. It can be one set. Yep. It can be a handful of actors. They're all in uniform, so we're not talking about a lot of costume changes. Yep. Uh, in fact, all of the extras costumes I bought off eBay. I bought all the World War II uniforms for the, all the extras were bought off eBay, and I sold them back on eBay after the film wrapped and made a profit on those, oh all those little uniforms. I oh think I, I cleared 30 or 40 bucks oh on these goodness. uniforms. And I knew, though, that the, the set was going to have to be tricky. And we had thought yeah. about a couple different options for the set. One option was to use a standing set in Los Angeles. And there are sets, things like 
courtrooms, things like that, sure. paneled rooms sure. that you can find a standing set sure. and just go in and use that. I'd also thought about trying to rent a a mansion. You can find some, you know, French chateau style yes. mansions in LA. And the the story there would have been that command had kind of, you know, taken over this, you know, country estate yes. to base their operations in. But the most cost effective way of doing it was was to rent this uh, soundstage okay. in LA okay. that had a very turnkey operation. If we'd rented a mansion, I would have had to bring in trucks, catering, porta potties, right. all that kind of stuff. But with this soundstage, all that stuff was taken care right. of. So we kind of designed this slightly Doctor Strange lovey and kind of black box type set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Fortunately, in Los Angeles, there's great resources in yeah. terms of props and equipment and stuff. So we got a lot of props out of the Paramount. I uh, had a friend pull a favor for me mm -hmm. in the Paramount prop department. Yep. We kind of raided their prop yep. department. There's a couple of other companies that rent period props, and we were able to get just big pieces of equipment. I don't really care what they were, yeah. but they looked like things with lots of dials and gadgets on them. Well, that, that kind of... Uh it gave you flexibility creatively because you actually, you know, you weren't so much trying to literally recreate a war room. You were expressionistically talking about the, the nature of these places. And you, exactly. you, you mentioned Dr. Strangelove, and then you even mentioned the idea of the French chat Chateau, which makes me think, you know, iconically in terms of black and white war film, you've got, on the one hand, Paths of Glory, which in mm -hmm. fact the Central Command is a French chateau. Mm -hmm. And then you have, of course, Dr. Strangelove, where yeah. Kubrick himself chose to take the idea of a war room and create this expressionistic version. So there's a nice sort of sense of iconography and homage going on there, which of course lends to the, um, the tone of what mm -hmm. you're trying to do, that sort of uh, uh, darkly comic vision. So when you were working on the film and thinking about the aesthetic in that way. And when I say aesthetic, I mean sort of the tone of the humor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, the way you wanted to handle the voiceovers and the performances and all of that. You know, how did you ultimately decide on that sort of uh, feel of, I want you to take this seriously because there is a serious message here, mm -hmm. but I really want you to, you know, have fun on the ride as you're going through. Yeah. What, what was that like for you as writer and director? Very tricky. Yeah. Very tricky because as fun as it is to be able to uh, use old footage, yeah. it does put some constraints on you. And the trick with this balance was that I knew I couldn't really play the new scenes very broadly. Right. I could not have a lot of huge slapstick or mugging at the camera or kind of physical comedy in the new scenes because that would be completely out of place with it the old scenes. It would just jar completely yeah. with what was happening in the older the, films. Because the old scenes, I mean, we put some narration of the old scenes and we, we did some things in the editing with the old scenes to give them more humor, mm -hmm. but uh, we, they're still played straight. Right. And so the new stuff kind of had to also be played straight. So it was, it was a very narrow target to yeah. try and hit. And that went down to casting the actors who got it, essentially. Yes, like, you know, in, that's, that's what I mean. You have to kind yeah. of know what degree exactly. to sort of be aware of what you're doing. Exactly. And yet at the same time, you gotta be fully committed to the truth of those circumstances or the, 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 the larger meaning falls away. Yeah, and in the casting process, it was important to kind of go through the actors and kind of just see that they got it, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And if they got it, then it's like, great. Yeah. You, and then, then they know what they're doing. I, I met with, uh, with uh, Mackenzie Aston, who's a great actor. He was on Without a Trace, in fact, and uh, he's a really great actor. And he, I met him the first time. He didn't audition. I just kind mm -hmm. of went and knew yeah. my our casting. You had a relationship our, with him because you Our casting on, director yeah. knew him as well. Yes. And so uh, I went over to his house and, and met him. And he uh, looks like a very handsome young guy, but he looks mm -hmm. like a surfer dude. You know, his kind of hair is all out, he's unshaven. I thought, how is this guy going to play World War II? Right, you know? right. But he came in on the first day, hair was cut really nice, and he came in with his Ronald Coleman kind of mustache. Okay. And he said, I think the guy should have a Ronald Coleman mustache. I said, perfect. He got it. He got it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so did Pat Muldoon. And of course, Elizabeth Bennett has yeah. this very classical beauty. She yes. looks like a very classically beautiful she person from the 40s. She has that 40s kind of, yeah, iconic yeah. beauty look. But yeah. also sort of the steely 
Mm -hmm. sense of that sort of nouveau feminism that was happening at the time, a woman yeah. in war and her place in it. Well, there's a couple of World War II films that I recommended that she go and watch. Yeah. And there's a couple of gags we wanted to play, because they're often in these World War II films, the actors will kind of look off to the side, they'll kind of look up, yes. and they'll kind of, to no direction in particular, yeah. but it's yeah. kind of into this nice light, and, yeah. uh, and they'll say something silly. Yeah. And so we did that, and of course, my DP was also a guy who got it, you yeah. know, and he was yeah. able to light this thing in a way that yeah. was reminiscent of the 40s photography. So right. she's always a little bit hotter. Yes. Figuratively and literally <laughs> a little bit hotter mm -hmm. in terms of her lighting than mm -hmm. everyone around her because she's bathed with a beauty light. It's a yeah. little light and a snorkel that my DP set up. And yeah. this is stuff that I didn't talk about at all. He's just doing this on his own. And it's like, fantastic. How many days? They get it. How many days on that soundstage? Five. No. Five days. Okay, Five well, days. I'm saying no, and then our viewers are going to see why. Yeah because you accomplished quite a bit in that five days. It was a lot of planning. I'm kind of, I'm kind of an anal person when it comes to planning. Military so, planning. A lot like. of planning, a lot of storyboarding. I actually did some like little animatics of okay. some of the shots. And, uh, and then whenever possible, and this is I think a really great trick because this really does harken back to the filmmaking of the 40s, yeah. is whenever possible we try to do things in a one-er, what they call a one-er, mm -hmm. which is basically the whole little scene mm -hmm. is going to be one shot. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of them in the film that really came out really nicely. I'm really proud of these are one-ers. Uh, and in some ways I wish that I'd be able to do a lot more razzle-dazzle stuff with the directing. If mm -hmm. I'd had more time, there would have been a lot more, I think, razzle-dazzle stuff. But in hindsight, it might, may have been to the benefit that things were kind of limited and our time was limited because it looks like the, a rushed military training film was was probably done. They made well, these films back then in a very short time frame too. You say razzle dazzle but the truth is if you think about you know uh, from the point of view of people like us who love uh, the great directors and classic film to me what's razzle dazzle today if someone can stage in the master like John Ford did. I mean the idea of a yeah. director now who can set the camera, set the ground plan, yeah. move the actors in a motivated narrative way in space yeah. is almost a lost art. Because of I agree 100%. Uh, be, it, because of this sense of well I'll just go here and I'll I, just go I agree there. 100%. I look at uh, you know I, I'll talk to my own students and say yeah. you got to look at this scene in the searchers where they're having yeah. breakfast and and the camera doesn't move, and they kind of look at it and go, well, 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 "Where are the cuts?" And I, I said, "Well, that's the beauty." I agree. He didn't have to absolutely. cut. Absolutely, and I'm, you, you I'm were totally, working I'm in so that so style. Right? You know, I, on the one hand, I say for my creative thing, my creative sensibility, I love that. Yeah. That's what I love, and that's why I think really is a lost art. Yeah. Career-wise, yeah. I kind of wish I had done more razzle dazzle because if I send this out as a reel, they think it looks. They old think, fa they boy, go, this well, is old-fashioned. Like He's not cutting. <laughs> He's like, well, why, yeah. why aren't you where's having three, where's the coverage? And, and you know, the where's, you're holding a, a yeah. shot for more than two seconds. <laughs> exactly. It's really pathetic, but exactly. I, I think it is a lost art, and I feel that there's a great deal of power that you can get from composition, from mise-en-scene, you well, know, it's, it's great stuff, and we were able to do a little, little bit of it in this film that I am really proud of, yeah. in, the, in the constraints that we had. Yeah. And it fits, it fits that style of filmmaking, of, of a training film, of a 40s movie which was very direct, very honest. That's right. And in some ways, I really love that and have a great deal of respect for that. And it is goes back to John Ford and William Wyler and all these well, stories. To, to sort of bring us full circle, I mean, if you look at the budget and, and time constraints someone like Stanley Kubrick faced on Paths of Glory and Dr. Strangelove, mm -hmm. this again was part of the, his reality, but at the same time, the mise-en-scene of what's happening in those films with very, very, you know, yeah. limited resources is is what we call iconic cinema now. And and the uh, idea yeah. that, you know, the idea that that, that is somehow, you know, uh, old-fashioned or something like that is just, just an odd sort of uh, phenomenon. And I, you know, I do wonder, it's like, is it coming back or not? I mean, I, I've worked on TV shows where that style of directing is kind of mandated, basically. Yeah. It's basically yeah. mandated. You're going to shoot this from five different angles right, with right, five different right, focal length right, lenses right. through three panes of glass right. and we're going to jump cut. Yeah. It's a way of 
keeping things active. I yeah, guess they're worried yeah. that people are going to grow bored or, or somehow confused that, that if something isn't cutting on all the time. And I think it's so such a crutch and such a cliche now that I'm hoping the pendulum will swing, swing back. back. Well, you know, it's also the idea of control. I mean, if there's enough coverage and all that, they can cut the scene down to, yeah. they can cut a five minute scene down to 20 yeah. seconds. I, mean, I heard an apocryphal story where, you know, occasionally the studio would demand that Ford do coverage. It's yeah. probably not true, but it tells the sort of spirit of it is he'd set the camera up in a different position, put yeah. his director's chair down there, light a cigar, sit under it, and let the smoke just drift in front oh. of the camera, and people go, this is useless. Well, you better use the master. Then. You see, I, I heard another <laughs> apocryphal story about Ford. The one I heard is that he would sit near the camera, but he always had a hat on. Okay. And he always, whenever he didn't like a take, he would yeah. take the hat off, and he'd wave the hat just off wave it in front of the <laughs> lens. Oh, the so lens that would so kill the do. shot. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's... Um, yeah. Uh, I can understand it from a TV standpoint right. a little bit because right. in television there is a lot of time constraints yeah. and yeah. sometimes you do have to either tighten a show or you have to lengthen a show. You have to yeah. pad it out a little bit. So you do need some coverage. But what I think is sad is that, is that a lot of directors, they don't go in to a scene yeah. pre-planning it, pre-blocking it, and yeah. using the power of a composition That's to tell right. that story. That's right. And it's kind of getting lost art. It's also getting a bit of a lost art on the actors' side of things. You have a lot of actors that, I don't want to sit down, or I don't yeah. want to walk with this yeah. thing. Why, some, why do I have to move so I know, much? I, I don't want to walk here, there. Yeah. And you, you, it's tough to tell you know, an actor who's yeah. you know, had a long career to yeah. say, well, you know, this, much of this, the power of this scene yeah. has nothing to do with the words, the yeah. dialogue. It has to do with the fact that this is a low angle shot of you walking. It's visual Through, storytelling. It's, it's, it shows your relationship, your power to right. other people around you. It's all about those intangibles. Right. And if you, if, you, if you can't convince them of that, or if they aren't familiar with that, or are willing to work with that, then it's, right. it becomes difficult, and you've well, lost something. Great. Now here's a look at the trailer for Military Intelligence and You. These last few years have been pretty rough, but all across our great land, Americans have answered their nation's call. Farmers and factory workers, coal miners and cattle ranchers, you've sworn to defend our great land and the freedom we cherish. You know how to fight. Basic training took care of that. And you have been given the finest arms and equipment. There's just one thing missing, what we call military intelligence. For it is intelligence that distinguishes dangerous enemies from merely annoying foreigners. Now a new training film dramatizes the importance of knowing what we're attacking before we attack it. From the makers of Your Friend the M16 and Syphilis, the Enemy Below, comes Military Intelligence and You. Cannes, Berlin, Toronto did not accept this film. But soon, freedom-loving audiences everywhere will learn the importance of intelligence. General, the 4th Armored Division is just 100 miles south of Sector 19. If we move them we north... We can't attack based on a hunch! What sort of nation would we be? We just went around sending in the troops just because we thought something might be there. Action. Adventure. Social satire. Bye, Jimmy. And yes, even good old-fashioned American patriotism. Why do they hate us? We're America. We're the good guys. What's there to hate? It's not our fault. We're better and smarter than everybody else. It's just the way God made things. Patrick Muldoon stars as Major Nick Reed. Stuff like this didn't happen, wars wouldn't be held, would they? With the lovely Elizabeth Bennett as Lieutenant Monica Tasty. What happened to you? What happened to the man that I had great sex with? With John Rixey Moore, Eric Youngman, and Mackenzie Aston as Major Mitch Dunning. It's military intelligence and you, coming soon to a briefing room or mess hall in your theater of operations. So, uh, Dale, satire, mockumentary, parody. I'm just thinking about the last, I don't know, decade of filmmaking and this, this explosion or idea of, of working in and out of genre. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think of the Sasha Baron Cohen films and, yeah. and, and all of that stuff. Your film has its own unique place in this idea. Hard to label it a genre. Are these, yeah. are these words pointless now? 
I mean, what, you know, as a filmmaker, do you even Boy. think of them anymore? Are there, are there any use to you? Uh, it's difficult to answer that question yeah. in a way. Yeah, it's a very tricky time in filmmaking, as you're probably aware. It's, it's a very tumultuous time. Uh, the medium is changing, distribution is changing, so it kind of makes sense that the kind of films that are being made mm. are changing. And uh, a lot of that plays into the internet, and it plays into, mm -hmm. I think, a younger generation that's very accustomed to seeing f short, short, vignette type stories. Okay. Stories that are delivered in almost a sketch comedy fashion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Longer forms are trickier. And even in the longer forms, I, my pet theory on, on film history is it's probably since you know, the late 70s. Yeah. I think we've been basically telling the same stories in cinema, just telling them with better technology mm -hmm. and more profanity and mm -hmm, stuff like mm -hmm, that. You know, mm -hmm. we've been taking basically recycling stories. Mm -hmm. So I think we're kind of, in a weird way, uh, on the brink of something new okay. because we've run out of redoing the old. Yeah. You know, there's only so many times you can retell the same story. Yeah. And a, one alternative to that is to do a parody, you know, and that's, okay. that is a legitimate way. It's, uh, to, it's, it kind of upends something. It's, it's not really original, but it's kind of a twist on original. Well, it gets us, I mean, it, whether it's a comedic parody or it's a, something that sort of is a genre folding in on itself, it makes us look at the form in a new way. Yeah. I mean, I think about you know, in the history of theater, th you know, theater itself had straight theater and comedy, and then it became self-aware, and then exactly. theater deconstructed itself, mm -hmm. and it reconstructed itself, and, you know, with performance art and, and the irony, and, and certainly, yeah. you know, the late 20th century, you know, philosophically, if you think about deconstruction, uh, semiotics and all that, the whole thing was, you know, is, is the form its own message and, and, and how do we deal with that? And it does seem like, you know, uh, our generation, our time in film is really willing to say, I don't, I don't think there's any reason I shouldn't put a fictional scene like this next yeah. to a piece of uh, archival footage or even do some documentary work out there mm -hmm. and blend it. I mean, uh, you know, we, we had a guest on earlier who did a film uh, uh, about a shooting here in the Central District in Seattle where he would stage actual scenes and then yeah. literally have the care actors turn the camera and address it in sort of an homage to the Brecht epic theater style. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is this actually gives you more possibility now as a filmmaker. Well, it's very grab bag and that's a good thing for a filmmaker yeah. because I, I've, actually, I've written scripts that have weird stuff thrown in yeah. where, you, where you can break away from a story and have a character talking to the camera. Yeah. That kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's jarring, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you could look at the Austin Powers films. Every once in a while, they did that kind yes. of thing. Yes. And you can have subtitles. Look, it goes back to Woody Allen and Annie Hall, have subtitles under a scene. Yeah. So, As a matter of fact, I think of that moment in, is it in Annie Hall where he, he literally says, you know, well, Marshall he, McLuhan he, he says he the medium is the message, and McLuhan. he has Marshall McLuhan walk I mean, you want, a, you want a textbook of yeah. breaking genres. Yeah. Annie Hall is the okay. textbook of breaking genres, and that was, you know, 40 years ago yeah. or whatever now. I think that a lot of it is, it, it, it's tricky. In part, this film was done the way it was because it was kind of designed into it. I knew yeah. that I could make an interesting novelty film yeah. uh, by using this old footage and by passing it off as a long-lost training film. Yeah. Would I do that again, or would I do that if I had five hundred thousand or five right. million dollars to work with? Right. Probably not. I'd right. probably do something else. Right. Because I think that there is the 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 difficulty is that once you do start tweaking those things, there's only so much you can do. You can go down that road a right. little bit of ways, right? But you can only go down it so far. We've had Blair Witch, we've had Paranormal Activity, we've had mm -hmm. some films that kind of uh, are trying ostensibly pass themselves off as documentaries. Clover, uh, Cloverfield. Clo Cloverfield, yeah. you know. It, there's a lot of, you know, the whole talking to the camera. I mean, look how, look how that has become yes. uh, such a, uh, a new trick in The Office or in Modern Family. You've right. got every once in a while a character just stops and you have this headshot of them talking right to the camera. Right. For some strange reason, and everyone has a documentary being made about themselves, I guess. But that yeah. probably yeah. stems from reality programming and the real world and all Good those point. things. Reality program informing that. Yeah. So all point. these things are being, you know, cuisinarded and put together. Mm -hmm. I, I still think that there's only fo so far you can go down because I still think that there is, a, uh, a great desire for the audience to lose themselves in a film. Yeah. And 
they want to go, sub submit to a really interesting cinematic experience. Yeah. And when you break that fourth wall or have someone talk at you, or when you have a lot of narration, it's it it works, but it it only works on one level. You can't yeah. get, to, I think, to some deeper emotional levels. So as much as I like doing it, yeah. there's also a lot of area and ter territory I'd like to explore well, not doing it. It's, it's interesting because the, the tone of your film, the, the sort of satirical, self-aware nature of the film, I mean, you know, underneath it's dealing with a very, very disturbing mm -hmm. uh, uh, topic. And I, you know, no matter what one feels about the, the wars that America has just gone through in the last mm -hmm. decade, the simple fact is we now know that the intelligence that led to it was dubious. Mm -hmm. And our Secretary of State went before the United Nations and presented this intelligence yeah. as bona fide. But here we are looking at your film, and the fact is bin Laden is dead mm -hmm. because of military intelligence. And a lot of people will make a joke and say military intelligence is like an oxymoron, like jumbo yeah, shrimp. Exactly. Well, look at what, you know, are we getting better? Is that what's going on because we've been looking at it? Were we just lucky? Is this something that is just a part of our society that we mm -hmm. all kind of go, we get it, we get the polemic, we get it, but we just have to go on that way? I mean, do you think there's been any impact yeah. uh, with what's happened in, in our I, country with that experience to now? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. I think that there's certainly going to be, it's, it's certainly unlikely that we will see in the near future mm. uh, another war of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of saber rattling about Iran right now. Yeah. Yeah. And in some ways, the saber rattling that led up to Iraq is yeah. what really inspired this film. Yes. It, it wasn't so much the you know, that I'm anti-war, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. something like that. I, it was a, it was, I was very conscious of the fact of being, trying to be as clear as possible that I am Im very impressed and supportive of what troops yes, do. of course. But I am very critical of what some people who send them into harm's way do when they do it incompetently. Right, right. And, uh, and I think that the lead up to Iraq, even then, I think was incompetently handled. And I think right. there's lots of people who were saying it yeah. was incompetently handled yeah. and the intelligence was not sufficient yeah. to do these things. Yeah. And so if there is kind of a takeaway of the film, it's, you know, let's get our intelligence right. And right. when the intelligence does do right, then right. we are making hopefully good decisions and we are taking out bad guys that need to be taken out. Yeah. yeah. And we're not, we are, are hopefully in the process of that preventing having to send yeah. a lot of people into harm's way that yeah. we might be able to, to save from having to go through that experience. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of decision making, Dale, you're the writer and the director on the film. And I presume this is something that, uh, you know, is a part of who you are as a filmmaker. So that means all the decisions rest with you. You can't turn to the writer and mm -hmm. say, if only this scene worked, I could have made it happen. And you can't be the writer yeah. that goes, if only if that director did it right, it's all going to work. Yeah. How, how do you... Uh, how do you deal with being the one per sole, per sole arbiter right. of the piece? And, uh, you know, and will you continue to do that? I think there's a good argument to be made that writers shouldn't direct their own stuff mm. and directors shouldn't write their own stuff. I think there's actually a, an argument to be made that outside perspective yeah. is really important. Because the toughest thing about this film, because it was, I mean, it was heavily researched. Yeah. And we had, I had sorted through lots of different options and opportunities and permutations of what you can do with old footage. Mm -hmm. And even through post-production, it's like, well, can I, can I, I could think up another sequence or another, another thing. And yeah. I can do that yeah. because it's a narrated film. I can write a new chunk of narration. Yeah. I can cut together this footage. Very flexible and very spontaneous. And that's, yeah. that's wonderful stuff. Um, but it's, it's also tricky because there was nobody else there yeah. in that respect who had looked at all this footage, who knew all the footage as deeply as I did. Uh, who knew what what could be tweaked and who yeah. you know it was it was, so it was it was tough to be the only guy in the room sometimes yeah. Yeah. and it and it's nice you know having worked on some television shows it is nice to be in a room with other writers where you can throw ideas around and kick stuff around I think that there is at the end of the day one person does have to kind of say that fits the tone this doesn't fit the tone and you know kind of set that one that one thing here tell people where the center of the target is you know yeah but it's helpful to have people there to, to help out with that. Would I write and direct? I'd love to write and direct again. Believe so you're, me. So oh, I, so I, you, can you give I, us a little I'd love hint about that. what's next for you? Because we talked a little bit before the show. You're back in Seattle. Yeah. You're, you're, you're here. There's a lot going on in Seattle with filmmaking yeah. right now. What can we look forward to from 
deal well, with Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a three-prong approach, okay. basically, is my three-pronged approach. One is I'm writing scripts still okay. uh, that I give to my agent and we hopefully set up okay. in Hollywood, and that's things that are written for the business. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. The other one is I'm running a couple of things that are smaller, and they could be small, modestly budgeted films okay. that I would like to put together the financing and make Great. myself. I have a nice teen romance that's set in the San Juans. It yeah. would be a fun little film. It could be very easily made. And the third prong is there's some interesting stuff going on in Seattle, uh, web stuff, internet stuff, animation stuff yep. that is... It's so computer-based and so quick and fast, facile, I guess mm -hmm, be the word, mm -hmm. that you can do it for three cents and put mm -hmm. it out on the internet. Mm -hmm. And that's another venue that I really want to explore because there's some really interesting stuff being done up here. Great. Well, we'll look forward to more and we'll have you back and see what, sure. uh, we'll see what happens next. Um, I want to thank you for watching Backstory with us. My name is Andrew Tsao, and I will see you again behind the scenes. Thanks, Dale. Thank you. It's been great.